Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and each week I'll be speaking to some of the brightest minds in tech and product, finding out what they do, hearing some of their stories, trying to get some advice for me and for the rest of us. In this week's episode, The Product Whisperer, I'll be asking some of the important questions about autism. What is autism? How do people treat autistic colleagues? What do autistic people think of non-autistic people? For answers to all of these questions and more, please join me for One Night in Product. So, my guest tonight is Martin Gaspar, a product leadership consultant, expert in conversational interfaces, product discovery, also the producer of a recent video entitled Working with Autism, Powers and Challenges, founder of the Product Whisperer, Product Discovery and Customer Engagement Specialist. Hey, Martin, how are you doing today? Great, thanks. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. So, obviously, the thing that's really brought you to people's attention recently has been this video, which has been getting a lot of really good feedback and uh, a lot of great comments and engagement. But I guess to start with, for many, the the cliche about um, autism and, and the autistic spectrum is it's all about Rain Man. It's all about guys counting cards, people doing impossible sums in their heads or remembering dates from hundreds of years ago and the exact day. I'm personally assuming that that doesn't reflect the complexity of the of the spectrum and uh, or really reflect you at all, or indeed most autistic people. So, so how would you yourself describe autism to the to, to people that aren't really aware of, of what it means <laughs> totally yeah so autism is a developmental disability and that kind of changes the way you process information so to put simply you just think differently this can vary so much from person to person which is why it's called an autism spectrum disorder so sure some people have exceptional abilities like rainbow but some autistic, autistic people can't talk or be in relationships Often autism comes with other disabilities too. Like, for example, you can be deaf, have ADHD, anxiety, dyspraxia, the list goes on. So actually I have both ADHD and dyspraxia too. But for a more accurate picture on autism, I recommend watching X plus Y, Life Animated, Love on the Spectrum, and of, and of course Tempo Gradient. Like, she's just awesome. Hmm. Yeah, I also remember recently a show on TV called The A Word, which I think was based on a book talking about um, a family growing up with uh, with a kid who was who was diagnosed on the spectrum. I think uh, one of the, the the good things for me is that uh, whilst obviously there's still a lot of misunderstanding about what what the the, the autis, autism and the autistic spectrum means, that, that at least there's a lot more uh, ability to to find out these days. Because back in the past, I guess it, it was a lot a lot more different. Um, but how old were you when, when you were first diagnosed? Yeah, absolutely. So in the past, it was just not even understood. I myself was 30 when I got diagnosed during a special needs assessment concerning my ADHD. So I was talking to this senior psychiatrist at the time, and I was describing my family to her. And she said, wow, it sounds like you and all of your mom's side of the family may have autistic traits. So let's get you checked out. And that's that's the story, really. Wow, and it, well, so they checked the entire family, or did they just check you to start with? They they just checked me. Okay, and um, did that make a lot of sense to you then, based on obviously your own experiences? Was was that a surprise, or or was that something you kind of were already thinking about? You know, I always just thought I'm a bit quirky, and I always felt I'm a bit different. But people throw around these labels. I knew I have ADHD since I was eight, so I didn't really know what's what because I'm just me. Did you, did it make, I guess, did it make sense to you? Oh, yes, it, abs- it absolutely made sense. So once I read what autism is, I, I just basically every single thing or most of the things that people have, I kind of have it. Now, you're Hungarian, as we discussed uh, before this call, and you've come over to, to England. You're working in a, in a pretty, pretty high powered product position. You're, you're working with lots of people that you have to kind of really get into their, their heads to understand the needs and the, the kind of the challenges that, they're, that you're trying to solve for them. And if trying to do that as with autism and also in a foreign language, if, if that's an even bigger barrier to cross or if that's something that you feel is not really. So firstly, Having from a foreign language and dealing with it is tough uh, because Hungarian is a language that doesn't really enable vagueness. So everyone always knows when you're talking about, even if you say something inaccurately, and there aren't really many accents. 
So learning about how to be totally clear and explicit when communicating in English, as well as demanding that from others, that's kind of has been a challenge. But also as a product person, we have to strive for clarity, right? And that's that's tough. Sometimes my face, I, I don't know what my face does. And sometimes I don't understand people's emotions and body language, and I can't empathize with them within the moment. So there I struggle, but I can come away and think about it, and I will understand everything. It's just in that meeting in particular where it's a bit challenging. So if I work with people long term, they just get used to me, and we will get on just fine. If people see me first and I stare at them a bit awkwardly without even meaning to, you know, <laughs> that that can cause people can just take it on themselves. I'm staring at them because their makeup is funny or whatever, but it's there's nothing to do with them. It's just my face. I'm sorry. And do you tend to kind of just try to explain that up front? Is that something that you've done as a kind of a kind of almost like an introduction strategy just to stop that happening? Or is, is that something that just kind of comes out during the work process? So it really depends on what type of engagement it is, right? Because if I if I'm leading a product team, a group of product managers or something, I have manager read me's and I also tell them that hey this is who i am these are the texts and these are don't take it personally this is who i am and this is how to deal with me fine so i say that personally i send the notes and memos out but when i'm dealing with a random stakeholder like a high-powered buyer or or a customer coming in for a customer interview i sometimes tend to lead let let the ux people for example lead those interviews and i just silently observe in the background to avoid any sort of uh, to avoid freaking them out, basically. Right, yeah. I, mean, I guess uh, you just need to use all of the tools that you have available to you in any situation. So, obviously, the one of the things that, again, brought you to, to the attention maybe of the wider world was the, the video you put out, Working with Autism, Powers and Challenges. What What made you decide that this was the time to put that video out? Well, I mean, I was I was just thinking about the fact that my openness about being autistic hasn't really meant that people really understood me better. So to a larger extent, people aren't to blame for this, for simply not knowing, you know. I wanted to be proactive and help educate at least a chunk of, of the tech community and involve them in the conversation about neurodiversity. And I also want to inspire my peers to open up, up, open up about the condition. It's partly because it needs to be done. And it's partly because I would, it would just make my life a lot easier if people understood me more. Plus, it breaks my heart if I find out half year into working with someone that or they're, they're dyslexic and they're ashamed of it. Like, come on, you, you're an excellent person that, that does not define you. But if I know, I'll, I'll, I'll just know what to do. Right. So, yeah, I guess being almost like a, an ambassador in this case for kind of the standard bearer to come out and say, this is... This is what I, this is what I have to do, uh, and this is what it means. And I think that that's actually a, a really powerful message to bring up because you're right. I think that a lot of people, uh, they kind of suffer in silence because they don't know what to say and they don't think that people are going to accept it. So I think that kind of having the courage to go out there and 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 kind of put that on a plate for people is 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 you know really really admirable. So obviously congratulate you on that, um, and I'm hoping that you'll that you'll get the feedback and the, almost like the support from the from the wider community as and to try and find out more because I, I 100% agree that, that just having that kind of clarity and um, understanding and, and just making, again, sort of uh, autism and, and autistic spectrum disorders more uh, more awareness of, of autism in the workplace and, and, as you say, sort of neurodiversity, I think is a really, uh, really valuable, uh, really valuable thing. Yeah, and if I can help people with my courage or show them that you can actually be a product leader, it's fine. It's it, it's just great. And the community has been really, really supportive. And I, I seem to have struck a chord with some people, which I'm, I'm really genuinely happy about. Mm. Yeah, well, long may it continue. But why don't we move away from from that video and, and, and from that topic for a short while and, and talk a little bit more about your, your, your day job. So the things that you're that you're working on at the moment. Uh, I know you've got a lot of history in uh, chatbots and voice assistants. Um, how did you get into that 
kind of line of work uh, what, uh, and, and how's that been? Yes, it's fantastic. After university, I started to work as an AI researcher. And my first project was actually on the largest chatbot project at the time in the UK. We were researching and defining the ways people want to talk to machines, which was quite, which is an area that wasn't really studied at the mo- at the time. So during the project, I heard Duncan Anderson, IBM Watson CTO at the time, talking about bots and the future of work and AI. And I got hooked ever since. It's such a fascinating topic. I just love it. So the the stuff that you were working on there, that was more like AI powered chatbots and automatic responses and, and, and things like that for things like customer support and uh, sort of searching or, or something different. Yeah, exactly. That that was for a major bank and they were they were the first bank in the UK who were trying to put out a chatbot and we just needed to understand how do people want to talk to this this new thing called called a bot, you know. What do people want from a machine? What's what's that conversation like? How does that shape up? And that's what we are trying to research and advising them on how to build this the right way. And has that been your kind of product history? Have you worked solely in that kind of area and sort of working with AI and working with sort of chatbot technology? Or have you been working on on other stuff before that? Oh, no, I worked on a lot of things, but I, I did work a lot with AI, with data science and with bots as well. But I have been doing B2B, B2C, and I've been consulting a really, for a really long time now. So I, I mm. had a chance to work in many different industries. So what's the coolest thing then that you've worked on across all of the different industries you've worked on? The thing that you would, if you had to impress someone at a, at a party or something like that, what, what would be the, the thing that you would, would say? Would it be the chatbots or would it be something else? Well, I think one of my favorite products that, that I was working for was for this HR tech startup where I created 80 bots in about three months. But it's not that it's a bot, but the bot enabled people who are looking for a job to see inside the stories within a company that they wanted to work in so they can really see what it's like to work there. Mm -hmm. I'm a pretty picky people about the jobs I take on. So I, (laughs) yeah, so for me, it was a re, it seemed like a really great idea. And the job is a job is just so much more than a job. It's your mental health. It's your self worth. It's your sense of purpose. It's your livelihood. It's everything. So it was really great to be part of this one, to help people really see the role before they get into it. You know, like the odd questions you you really can't ask at an interview. Yeah, I think also um, that really touches a nerve with me as well, that the, the whole idea that you're not just doing a thing, but that you're contributing to a to an effort or you're contributing to making people's lives better, which is, which is again, a really great... I think that's really great for any product uh, product manager because you, you just want to make sure that you're you're doing something that means something. Yeah, no, it's fantastic, and it was really well received. Yeah, I mean, did, did that go live? Is that something that went out? Is that something that people are using? Or oh yeah, it's live on eighty global companies' websites. Like just within the first month, we got like five thousand extra applications. We improved the rate of application by seven times, and we got thirty percent more engagement. Oh, nice! So you get some really good, strong KPIs off the back of that as well, which again is a ma- is a massive validation, I guess, of, of of the effort that you put into it. Oh yeah, exactly. No, it's, it is such a good project. So, you've also, I understand, been doing some lecturing um, at Goldsmith College. Um, so, so how's that been, and, and and how did you get into that? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was so so excited to be asked to do this. I actually studied at Goldsmiths, and while I was studying, I met one of the most influential people in my life, Dr. Chris Brower. So, Dr. Chris is leading the Masters of Innovation course, and it and one of his subjects, project management, covers project and product management, from waterfall to agile, the whole range, like everything. And he's been sort of a mentor to me. And he asked me to come back and talk about modern product discovery in practice to the students. So I really enjoy teaching that. And it's so great to see all these young people getting excited about product. Mm -hmm. So these are people that are literally probably about to potentially become product managers as, as 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 they come out and like the next generation? Yeah, absolutely. How did you get into product management in the first place? What, what, what is it? What was it that got you into product management? So I was always fascinated by innovation, solving complex challenges that helps others and stuff. 
I created startups in the chatbot and data science space. And after my last startup, I realized I was doing product management all along and I took up a, a role at a global company. So it was kind of by accident, I guess, because I had the vision for the startup, for the product, and I was managing the development teams as well as all the other aspects of, of running a startup. I actually gained a lot of really valuable product experience. Okay, so so it's quite quite a good uh, sort of journey. In. And based on that, would you say then that you're kind of an all rounder, more of a sort of a, what I'd say, sort of like a full stack uh, product professional, like kind of good at everything, or, or or do you have like some kind of comfort zones and some key skills that you like to 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 to, to fall back on? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I am comfortable with all aspects of the role. However, my particular strength are more around product discovery and scaling customer engagement. So the discovery is just so much fun. And if it's done wrong, it can lead to wasted energy, bad products. So I really like to get discovery right. And you can never really be too good to your customers, can you? So coming up with ways to sustainably engage customers is a challenge. I just love working on. Yeah, and obviously now you've got the product whisperer going. I guess that's that's its reason to be right. That's its value proposition is that you can that you're a specialist in that area and you can go and work with other companies to to help them become better at that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's 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 the whole point. Hmm. So again, I think if we go go back a bit to the kind of uh, sort of the concept of product managers and and sort of autistic product managers, it's so product management is. Oh, yeah, you, you you read a lot of books about the kind of intersection between sort of customer and tech and business and and how you have to build relationships and don't have direct reports. You have to influence and persuade. And I'm assuming that that some of the kind of more traditional uh, traits of of sort of autistic spectrum uh, would that it doesn't really feel like that that that's a hundred percent straightforward fit for for someone with autism. So is that is that true? Is, is, is it something that you've had to work on? So yeah, yeah, totally. It's not that straightforward, but you can still build relationships and lead with influence and persuasion if you're autistic. The difference is that instead of aiming for consensus, I'm striving to uncover the root of the issue. I use logic at the core of my teams. I create psychological safety by caring about my people, not how they work, but who they are like as a whole. I really aim to understand them deeply and create a culture of openness, honesty, and I encourage people to speak their mind. Once an idea comes out, we debate it and judge it by its own merit. My style works extremely well with high-achieving individuals and teams who are really motivated to get to the root of the issue and to build impactful solutions uh, that people love. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 yeah. I was going to say, so it's more about sort of adapting your working style to, to fit the kind of the, the, like the way that, that makes most sense to you and then trying to, to project that onto other people and, and give them the space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm not, it, it's, it's not diplomacy that I will be known for. It's more my logic. <laughs> and if, but if, if I can create that, that atmosphere and everyone really is just really happy to talk about their ideas and, and come forward and we debate and judge every idea by, by its merit, mm -hmm. you're still getting everything you want, right? You're still leading with vision. You're still leading with influence and persuasion. But instead of, of fake smiles, you're pers persuading people with, with, with logic and, mm. and you support your answers with data rather than opinions. Yeah, I remember reading a, an article which I shared with you, obviously, before this call, uh, of a, 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 an associate of mine who tried to frame his a view of neurotypical people with, from an autistic standpoint. And I think that thing about sort of fake smiles was was something that chimed with that uh, description as well, kind of like you, that you shouldn't need to do fake smiles and you shouldn't need to kind of be be all fluffy with people to, to get a good job done, I guess is is something that, that you would also agree with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In, in, in the workplace, people are strategically fake. And, and that's kind of <laughs> you're a professional, you know. And being strategically fake and deceitful is really draining because it's an extra layer of pressure that we don't really believe in that we should be doing, but we do it anyway. So for people in the workplace, it's often so much harder to be authentic than to be fake. I don't know why. But for autistic people, it's almost impossible to be anything apart from ourselves. 
And most of us struggle to understand why you do, why, why you do anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's that's interesting. So even even myself, obviously, as a as a kind of classic, uh, average, neurotypical person at work, I even even me. I mean, I, I'd say that I was somewhat of an introvert, but I feel that I almost have to put on a suit of of not being an introvert to to kind of certain not all the time, of course, but but certainly from time to time. Uh, and I think sometimes. Yeah, you especially after a really, really heavy day, or when you've been having to kind of, you know, kind of represent a certain image. You, you, there, there have been times where you kind of feel like you're coming out of of work, and and everything just kind of just collapses or deflates by the end of the day, and you, you kind of you're just exhausted from from the effort of presenting your, you know, for want of a better word, your best self. So, do you feel that that you have to do that yourself, like to to try to kind of make people feel comfortable and, and not have to explain yourself to them or is is that something that you just don't do because you don't feel that that's a, a valuable thing to do well i am always trying to make an effort to understand people better but i'm i'm a huge advocate for radical candor and i i just i think honesty is really important and i think we just shouldn't normalize fakeness as much as we do Mm-hmm. So I just come in at work and I'll, I'm just trying to be myself. So you just recommend being as uh, as, as honest with people as possible, for, for good or for bad? Well, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't advocate for going around and kicking into people for no reason. But, I mean, one of the points in being radically candor is that if you don't pull up people on things that they don't do right, you don't give them a chance to improve and you're actually hurting them. Mm-hmm. So by me being fake and not telling them what what the actual issue is, I'm not giving them a chance to better themselves. I really don't think that's fair. I think people are inherently good and they want to do better. So so we need to stand by them and support them in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read the book as well, the Radical Candor book. It was a, it was a really interesting book, actually, kind of uh, about you know because I've been in situations in the past, but both with me and, and me with other people, where I'm pretty sure that people are just almost dancing around, just trying to protect each other's feelings. And I, I think that you're right that that's not always uh, productive. Yeah. But I'm assuming that um, again, if we consider kind of stereotypical um, sort of traits that you yourself would be someone that, and I think we've mentioned it earlier in in the chat of kind of that, that you really appreciate unambiguous conversation that you, that you don't, you kind of want to not beat around the bush and you, and you want to make sure that, that you're having kind of very purposeful conversations. And one of the things that I find possibly even, even just for, for me in day-to-day life, sometimes it's almost like this imaginary conversation that, that I use to justify miscommunication, which is like, one person says it would be nice if uh, if we had a thing and the second person says yeah okay well we'll see if we can look into that and that both people walk out of that meeting thinking of, thinking different things about what's just been agreed like one person thinks that that's now on the roadmap one person thinks that they've said that they're going to look at it one day uh, and both of those people end up being unhappy further down the line so i'm i'm guessing for you that that kind of unambiguous clear conversation is almost at the the heart of what what you have to do yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, th- as you said, that's that that's not a productive conversation. So you always have to walk out with clear action items. Otherwise, you just be doing nothing. Mm-hmm. And what uh, benefits? I know. I mean, if we think back to your video title and the the superpowers that that that, that you know autism can can bring to the product role so like what what benefits do you think that you that you you and your condition bring to the uh bring to the world and the world of product well basically my brain works differently right so in every single meeting i will have new ideas different ideas i will think differently it is just a given i thought that this is an ability that will just go away but i have to realize that no that's, that's just my brain and I, I think because, because of that need for clarity, I'm always trying to understand what the root cause of the issue is. And that's what I'm trying to focus on every single time. What is the outcome we are trying to achieve? What's the root of the problem? How can we get there? And that, that's, that can be super helpful for, for product people. Hmm. And do you think that there's any benefits that, that your role 
or that the product role brings to 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 someone with you know, to someone with autism is that are there kind of does does it help has it helped you um in any way kind of look at things in a different way oh yeah i mean it's such a fantastic job it it helped me in a lot of ways but because autistic people have all this attention to detail they have the ability for deep focus mm. and they have a really good ability to retain information and to synthesize and understand and see patterns that other people don't come up with new ideas i mean you will be valued and celebrated for just the way you are and i think that's that's a that's a fantastic thing to do and i, I couldn't be happier i think product is is the best thing that happened to me career wise with regards to diversity in the workplace i mean this is something i know that you were talking about um in your uh, in your linkedin profile on the video I mean, when people think about inclusion and diversity, there's obviously a lot of really important discussions going on around at the moment about kind of ethnic minority um, and uh, kind of LGBTQ representation within the workplace and especially in sort of the tech industry, trying to make sure that that these groups are represented uh, and represented fairly and equitably. But um, there's obviously the, the the thing that doesn't always get caught up in that is that is as you put at the beginning of the call, kind of neurodiversity as well, and, and making sure that workplaces are suitable and, and appropriate for, for, for all, di- all different types of people, that, that uh, you know, whatever their kind of approach to, to, to life or their, the, the, their thought patterns. Do you feel that, or how do you feel that autism is treated in the workplace? Uh, great question. So it's been inspiring to watch the world pay more attention to diversity, and, and that, that's truly great. But yeah, as you said, neurodiversity feels relatively unaddressed by businesses. Hmm. I think that people don't get it, so they just kind of shrug it off, or they think that they uh, they get it, and they just make incorrect assumptions, and they just run with that. It's the same old story for lots of minority and disadvantaged groups, except neurodiversity just feels less discussed. Big companies are looking for a cog to slot perfectly in the machine, and diverse people will just never fit in, and they get discarded. So when I was working for this big company, I explained that that what autism is and what my specific needs are. For example, coaching and extra clarity in some areas. I was shamed for making these requests, and my requests got ignored, and I was made to feel like a nuisance. So flexibility and empathy is needed. Uh, it benefits everyone in the end. So, from your perspective, does it, is it just about uh, kind of awareness and, and and driving that awareness? And again, some of the, the reasons that maybe you put that video together in in the first place, or is there something else that that needs to be done? Is it is it just about making people more aware? I don't think it's just making people more aware. It's also how to deal with it and how does the system deal with it. Because so, for example, once I was told I needed to be able to understand and empathize with different audiences, but that's that's challenging with autism, right? So that that made me feel like I wasn't understood at all. It's like telling a dyslexic person they need to learn to spell to spell well. Like, cheers, mate. I I know, but can you just help me get better? So I can pretty much do anything if I'm being asked and if the request is clear. At most, I just need some context to deeply understand the issue. Some big companies, I find they're often not willing to do to even that. And there are times where I felt that I wasn't taken seriously. Like I'm not worth the effort. and Or, or that someone in my seniority just shouldn't need context. Which I find a bit silly. So... Yeah, I mean, so as I say, I, I think that from my perspective, um, it's... It, I think it's a common misconception, whatever your kind of um, sort of brain wiring and the and sort of thought patterns and, and mental models. I think that there's there's always this feeling that, that the more senior you get, that that you can just do it. Um, and and I, and I feel that that kind of kind of links in with what you're saying. It's like just because you're senior shouldn't mean that you don't need either coaching or, or help or, or, you know, support in, in different areas. And, and I think that uh, that's something that, that, that needs to be kind of considered. People, people aren't just okay because they get to a certain level. There's always, there's always something that people need support. 
Yeah, well, the thing is, we're not mind readers, right? Mm -hmm. Most of us aren't. So, yeah, most of us aren't. So, without having appropriate context, it's really difficult to do a really good job. I can do a mediocre one, but it doesn't help me. I, I, I'm aiming for the highest standards here, right? Then, then give me the tools so I can do that. Yeah, it feels like you have high standards, so I don't think that you... You sound like you probably wouldn't be very happy doing a, a mediocre job. No, not at all. So I'm assuming then that, for example, when you're interviewing for a, a role, I mean, obviously now you're in a, a kind of consultancy, so you're you're presumably pitching to, to, to people to, to, to kind of uh, get get work with them. Uh, I'm assuming that sort of interviews like that, even, even actual interviews in the past or, or pitching interviews or anything like that, that there, could, there must be a real range of interviewers that, that just... There, there, there must be some interviewers that just just don't know what to do oh yeah i mean you know interviewers sometimes they think they're freud reading <laughs> facial cues and body language it just doesn't work on neurodiverse people like come on so the regularly used excuse i heard myself and from a lot of others like me is that you're not a good culture fit and what does that really the, what that really means is that you're staring at me in a weird way and i really don't know how to handle it yeah but also like i'm not a good culture fit can you define your culture? Can you tell me how do I not fit in? It's just a really convenient and easy excuse to to tell someone that they, they're just not welcome here without um, having to ask tough questions, answer tough questions for the other employees. And there's another issue with the recruitment process is that neurodiverse people often take unconventional career paths and that's sometimes met with snobbery and judgment, you know. So I was working at this cons I was I was working consulting at this company and I was the head of product there and they were desperate for me to stay on for a permanent role but I just wasn't interested and I heard the CEO telling the recruiter to hire someone for my role who studied at Oxford or Cambridge with a STEM background with a STEM background why like if I'm good enough and I didn't come from an elite uni why would you make that a requirement only 2.4% of people with autism finish the high, any, high, any higher education at all. And most of us have very unconventional paths, like product people often do anyway. So we often get ruled out very early on in the process. And even if we manage to get an interview, then, then we are faced with even more biases. Yeah, and I guess that uh, leads on to my next question. is like when we're, when dealing with or yeah, autistic candidates and, and autistic colleagues, what should people not do? What if I if I'm for example, if I'm your boss or if I'm your colleague, what should I not do? So firstly, don't ignore me when I'm telling you I'm autistic. If someone is brave enough to share something that makes them that makes them vulnerable, don't ignore it or pretend that you know what to do. Mm. What you can do is you can be inquisitive, do research and ask questions. Don't rely on what you think you know about the condition. Like, I know how to deal with you, man. I've seen Rain Man. Everyone <laughs> is different, and you need to understand how someone's condition affects them personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of leaving their assumptions at the door. Yeah, exactly. Like, you can clarify. You can just ask me. Um, I have a mouth. <laughs> An autistic uh, friend of mine... Uh, many years ago, wrote a piece about um, his perception of neurotypical individuals. So, um, I'll, I'll link it in the in the notes for this episode. But he he kind of wrote it from the perspective of if neurotypical people were were you know, autistic and and non autistic people were the exception, and kind of gave a really long detailed treatment of his opinions of how people like me look to people like him. And I guess the question that comes off the back of that is, from your perspective, what behaviours of people like me that, that, that aren't on the autistic spectrum do you find just strange? All the lies. No one likes to think of themselves as deceitful, but everyone does it. It's, it's fascinating. Fake smiles, insincere interest in someone's weekend, questions that are <laughs> full of hidden agendas... We're all liars, and autistic people find it really difficult to understand why. Hmm. So, I guess things like small talk in the in the lift is just your idea of nightmare. It's 
it's really difficult. I'm, I'm really bad at that. And I'm, I'm really deeply interested in people, but I'm not interested in fakeness. I want to know them. I want to know their dreams, their aspirations, who they are as a person, not something, a, a generic answer of, yes, I'm good. Like, no, tell me that you're bad. Tell me why, and we'll discuss it. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like you're a big proponent of uh, meaningful conversations over kind of empty, empty words. Absolutely, yes. Which I think, to be fair, probably something we should all strive for. Uh, what would you do if you weren't in product? Like, do you have any kind of other interests that would be would be a passion that you'd be interested in pursuing if you hadn't made it as a as a as a product guy? Well, I think I'd start another startup or be a career and product or product coach. I'll, I'll, I will try to retire early and become an angel investor, hopefully, or maybe I just develop sauces for a living. I love a good sauce. Sauce, as in yep. something that you put onto food. Yep. What's your favorite sauce? Uh, I can't really describe it, but I do make it. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. I'm, ho- I'm hoping that we can get that in the shop sooner. But um, you might want to work. On, you might want to work on the uh, the value proposition for that sauce, um, so that we can have that for, it's for great the future. For chips. <laughs> and how uh, how would you personally describe product management? Um, to uh, a friend or a colleague, uh, someone you didn't know that, or someone that doesn't know what product management is like, what what's your kind of elevator pitch version of product management to the uninitiated? So funny you say that. One of my next videos in the pipeline is how to explain product management to your granny. Now oh, there you go. How would you explain it to your granny? <laughs> it's a bit long. I use the gardening analogy for them, but let's say I would want to explain it for a child. I would say something like product managers help build software, which people will like by finding the easiest and quickest way to do it. That's very, very succinct and uh, and very uh, very fair description. And um, do you have any advice for? Any up and coming young, ambitious, uh, autistic people today that yeah you know, they're they're maybe coming out of of school and and making their way into the world of, of work. Like, what, how would you advise uh, well, either the younger you, if you had a time machine, or the, the next generation? Like, how would you advise them, or any advice you'd give them make, uh, on their journey into the into the workplace? You are awesome and truly authentic. Own it. Use that to discover what makes you truly happy. And seek the support you need to make it happen because you'll need it. That's uh, definitely um, uh, some good advice there, and something that we could probably give a lot of people with, of, of, of all different uh, shapes and sizes. Because I think that, yeah, w- work can be hard when you're young, and I think uh, I can only imagine how hard it could be if you have uh, a poorly understood uh, condition that 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 people just don't know what to do with. So I think that having kind of role models like yourself who can um, kind of articulate and kind of help people who maybe don't have support is, is, is a really good positive thing. And I really hope that the videos that you're putting out as you, as you, as you go forward and, and some of the attention that you're getting really helps to drive that. I really hope so. Fingers crossed. Well, it's been a, an amazing chat and really insightful. Where, where, can, where can people get hold of you um, if they want to continue the, the discussion? You can find me on LinkedIn or you can find me on my website, product-whisperer.com. So that's your company website, is it? Yes. Um, and I'm assuming that people can come to your LinkedIn, which I'll link into the the, uh, the, the notes of the show and, and, and watch your upcoming videos um, and, and reach out if they if they want to talk about anything. Uh, Absolutely. Product or- anything related to product, autism, discovery, chatbots, customer engagement, I'm, I'm always up for a good chat. Excellent. Well, and this has been a good chat. So thank you very much for your time and uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you so much for the invite. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. As ever, it's my pleasure to have your attention. If you'd like to come onto the show to talk about your experiences, please feel free to pop to the website, onenightinproduct.com, click the link, leave your details, and we'll be in touch. Otherwise, of course, I'd appreciate it if you shared, followed, or liked this podcast on the app of your choice. Tell your friends about me and please come back for more on One Night in Product.